Kate. I'm Dave Perry. I'm the Executive Director of the Manufacturing Industrial Council of Seattle. You must be wondering why I'm here. <laughs> um, and I want to thank Jeff Shaver. Where's Jeff? Um, we were asked to be on the Cleveland High School STEM implementation team actually about two, two and a half years ago. And Jeff is a life sciences teacher there, and I got to know him through that effort. Through him, I met Nancy last spring, and geez, we've just been finding all these wonderful things in common ever since. And so uh, I found another one today in talking to Han. Um, one of the reasons I have to leave early, our office down in Georgetown is the meeting place for the board meeting of the Washington Industrial Education Technical Association, which is the State Association of Shop Teachers. And down there chairing that meeting, which I have to go to here in a while, is a teacher named Carl Ruff, who teaches at Roosevelt High School. A con told me that his student, his, his son went through Roosevelt. He said, geez, did you ever hear Carl Ruff? Just, oh, that's the guy who got my kid all excited. And Carl's a former Boeing engineer who, who uh, teaches engineering and material science at Roosevelt. And so how closely connected can we be? And in terms of substance, uh, we were on the skin, STEM task force that helped define STEM for the state of Washington two years ago. And when we were presented at that group with the federal definition of STEM, we looked at it and found out that 86% uh, of the jobs they were identified required a four-year baccalaureate degree, and half of those 86% of the jobs required more than a four-year degree. And since I was on the Cleveland implementation team, I said, well, you're talking about Mercer Island STEM, maybe Mercer Island. Uh, this sure doesn't look like Cleveland STEM. And then we started digging into their actual job descriptions, joking that, well, I'm sure they recognize brain surgeons, but not radiation technicians. Well, they didn't even recognize brain surgeons. And then we found out that the federal government recognizes high school cafeteria workers and cooks as STEM-based workers but not high school science, technology, or math teachers. <laughs> and so we were able to get the state of Washington going through sort of the process that Nancy was describing of working with them about everything in, in the real world that requires applied math, art, science, and technology skills, uh, including IT, but also tool and equipment use. An awful lot of the equipment use going on in this facility isn't just IT, I can guarantee you that. And so we were able to get a much more uh, generous definition of STEM for the state of Washington, and hopefully someday that will bear fruit and make it easier for you to get grants, and will someday wise up the federal government. And so I'm, I'm, I am a talker, so I'm going to cut myself <laughs> off there. We have huge things in common. The kids you're reaching, I think, are the same kids that our, our technology teachers are reaching. If you still are fortunate enough to have a technology teacher at your school, Go form a partnership with them. And our only shameless plug, we do the Green Industrial Business and Career Expo. This was our gimmick for reaching out to the education community actually starting about five years ago. This is the fourth one. We have through this met and seen some of the best learning projects in the state of Washington. I mean, stuff that just knocks your socks off. And it shouldn't be surprising how often those are the outcome of a partnership between a science and a shop teacher. So I'll stop. There's a set of those flyers, Adam. Yeah. Yeah. October 14th and 20th, you've heard 15th. It's the end service day. You're welcome. Time. So I'm Lon Nocturne. I came here to the center 26 odd years ago, a little after Nancy, but not too much, uh, uh, and came here to do science uh, and run a laboratory doing flow cytometry. And there was this guy in the restroom that I met who was in a suit who I kept talking to and didn't realize I think I told you the story. That, that he was the president of the center, and I was complaining about human resources. <laughs> <laughs> and ended up in human resources. Uh, and I've done some chemical engineering, I've taught, I've done some analytical chemistry and so on. But I've had this wonderful luck to have ended up here at the center, and over the last many years, I've done, and there's a lot of parts to HR, but the most fun part is hiring people. And I've had the fortune of hiring and interviewing hundreds and hundreds of people over the many years here at the center. Some of them have come through your programs. And so for me, filling the pipeline of folks, and I don't mean just the people that come here as faculty, because there are 3,000 people at the Hutch and 1,000 people at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and another couple thousand people who don't get paid by us but are banging around here doing something. But the, the, the wonderful thing about that is that the faculty only comprise the very top echelon of folks here, um, about 200 people. There's this whole spectrum of other folks including, I was just thinking about this when you're talking about funding, I just hired a major gifts officer and I was in his office yesterday talking about the SEP 
And, and this is a person sensitized to science, and I want him to go out and raise money to fund this program. His mm -hmm. name's Chris Ronsky, and we need to talk about this. But <laughs> it is people that come through your courses that go out into all these walks of life uh, that, that come back and make a place like this run, whether it be, and we were talking about the operating engineers. I can't get enough operating engineers. Most of who I have now came out of the Navy. They're all male. Uh, there's an apprenticeship program in the state, but I'm having a hard time getting people to go into that. The center has the first female apprentice in the operating engineers. The salary, starting salary is around 55000 And I can't get people to, to get into those jobs. I can't operate the uh, radiology program. I don't have enough people to do breast you know, mammograms up in the Kansas Care Alliance because there aren't enough rad techs out there. That career starts at fifty-five dollars or $65,000 a year, it, it, you know. This pipeline is easily fillable if we can get people pointed in that direction and get people excited. So one of the reasons I'm here is to talk with you about that. Uh, but before we engage, i got to tell you uh, one quick story. In this conference room, I heard Rebecca Skluth speak. Were you at that no, as well? So she came and talked about her book and what caused her to write the book about Henrietta Lacks. And, and so before the talk, I bought two books, sat here, listened to the talk, and then walked out and got in a queue to get them signed. And I said to one of our division heads, well, this one's for my son, and this other one I'm going to get signed and sell it on eBay. And behind me, I heard this voice go, oh, I heard that, and it was Rebecca Skloot. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually do have a signed copy. <laughs> uh, if you want to auction that next year, or that one off next year. So, anyways. so with that, I think we have questions, but I'd love to hear what we might uh, either of us be able to answer for you. It's more fun check. to interact. Is the sound with. okay? Can you hear? Good. It sounds like the sound is fun. So, you guys have some questions. Go ahead. You mentioned that you can't get enough people to go and do these careers. Um, right. Or I can't get enough people to hire. Yeah. So I was just wondering, if, just as a resource for us teachers, if you could tell us what program is training people for these careers. Sure. So that way Right. We've partnered with a number of the, the uh, community college programs, and actually uh, it's more complex than just that, but what's interesting is that there aren't enough instructors at the community college level to, to create enough students to, to get them uh, out there. So part of this, and we have, for example, with the uh, operating engineers here, partnered with Green River and Renton Boat Tech uh, to, uh, actually we pay into a training trust that then funds the tuition for the people that might want to go through those programs. I'm that desperate to get people through there. We have not done that for Rad Techs because this is a more recent development. Could you just give oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, but but to come hard. back to those positions, it, it's really a lack of people to train them and, and the recognition among the community colleges that they need to push people through that. You, you might be able to add to that. But to, to answer that question, an operating engineer, engineer someone with a mechanical background who has some specialty, such as uh, instrumentation that allows them to run the building controls. Uh, this building is so sophisticated, if you press the button for the lights, it actually doesn't run a 110 circuit. It sends a signal back to the central computer that says, gee, they want the lights on in the Belton Auditorium. And the computer moves that. So our engineers run around with laptops and handle the, the, uh, the building in that fashion. So building controls, people that understand how to handle the pipe plumbing and piping through this facility. Uh, um, a very, very sophisticated building maintenance engineer. Um, not unlike what you might have in your schools, except, uh, um, and in fact, sorry, I draw out a bit of myself, but the way we actually pay our operators is a little esoteric, is that the more skills you have, the higher your pay is. So I want somebody who can have a refrigerant and well and run the boilers downstairs and so on. And if you have all those skills, you could be earning somewhere in the range of $80,000 a year. Working so, so, okay, I'll, I would transfer the project to the Department of Education. Yeah. 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 Right. It's a two-year program. You can take it Renton, Oak Tech, or Green River, uh, and then apprentice after that for a couple of years. And, and move into a role. And um, it's not just us. All the major buildings, all the new and sophisticated buildings around town here, Children's, University of Washington, the high rise and so on, are desperate for these people. So a, they just represent also folks who are building these kinds of buildings. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Building the yep. stuff. 
making the stuff that goes in. And Nancy was at a conference we put on last May that included a speaker from MIT who came out here and did a study about why we don't meet the labor need of the aerospace industry in the state of Washington. And the tragedy is all these jobs they're describing, Nihani is going to fill the position. Okay, It's not our kids who get these jobs. Uh, we're importing people from other areas. Uh, so the MIT guy is a really interesting fellow, and his, his take was we violate the law of labor supply and demand. We have these two-year certificate programs or five- and six-year apprenticeship programs that cannot meet the need of employers like Fred Hutch or McKinstry or Boeing. Um, and yet the two-year and apprenticeship programs are almost always struggling for survival because they don't get enough kids from the K-12 system because there's such little, and this is where I can get really upset, there's such little connectivity between you and post-secondary. OSPI is in charge of graduating the kids from high school, community college is in charge of accepting the kids from high school. No one owns that gap in between of making sure the kids are there in September uh, after they graduate in June the way they used to be when I was a kid. So my question kind of goes off what you're just talking about. I don't have a shop teacher or anything like that at my school. Are there things that I could do in my, like, because I teach chemistry and biology, are there things I could do in my classes that would help encourage students to move towards maybe getting excited about what you're talking about? What district are you in? Seattle. Seattle, okay. Um, at the center school, which is kind of a... The, the answer to this, according to a, the, the, a speaker from Harvard, who will be back here on November 17th, actually we're doing a six-hour program for the State Convention of Elected School Board Members and Superintendents. There is, a, in a district like Seattle, there's a real leadership issue here about what connection institutionally the district is making with the surrounding community. Nancy and I are now part of a group that has met monthly with the Assistant Superintendent uh, because we brought that issue to them, but they're just not engaged with the business community. And so it's us, the Association of General Contractors, Nancy, and the Seattle Chamber of Commerce. And to answer your kind of issue in Seattle, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with it. It's going to take some, not hard, but some pretty significant institutional change to get you better connected with the business community. And then until that happens, you're, you're not going to have a way to know about this stuff. It's outside your life experience as educators, for the most part. and for sure outside the life experience of education managers and people who got doctors and then basically went back to high school. Wait, can I, I mean, <laughs> so, so yes, I agree with you about administration and institutional change. We could go on that forever. But at the same time, like, I'm trying to, because I don't have a background in what you have a background in, I'm trying to think of concrete, um, not necessarily lesson plans, but Okay, so attend that and I'll get some ideas. This is what we're doing. This okay. is our little way. We have, it's a two day uh, in service event. But I'm really, the Saturday, we've never done this before, is nothing but 90 and three hour workshops with the glaziers, the carpenters, the pipe fitters, bricklayers, cement masons, and the electricians. Just about number one, how if you have any of those skills and want to brush up on them, you can, which a lot of our shop fellows do. Uh, but if you want to learn about those skills, you can. And that's what we're going to try to do on an ongoing basis as a way to make this available to you so that you can come down and learn about what are these programs. And and by working with the district and figuring out, okay, how do we make that bigger? Because obviously it needs to be. This, this is not an answer. I'm going to point at this poster just for a second. It's an NIH poster that's available for free about jobs in this sort of traditional biomedical sciences. But would it help if we had some things yeah. like this, visuals like this, that could be in your school, yes. in your classroom? Yes. That's I want to respond directly to this too. Yeah. The, our engineers here, the group, and there are about 40, 45 of them, uh, uh, are very worried about this as well. They're also really excited about their jobs. They're really fun yeah. people to talk to. And so, honestly, uh, you know, up to a limited point, you could invite uh, the engineers. They come to your classroom, and if it's feasible, uh, uh, they like to show off. I mean, you, you don't realize it, but right here, you're sitting on top of a boiler room that's about a football field long. It's just, when you walk down there, it's stunning. I mean, I still like to hang out there. <laughs> because it's so cool. And so that's the kind of thing I don't know about. The way it worked for me is, it was my exposure to laboratories and science and machines that made me go, damn, that's what I want to do. And so it's OK, because the center has got a fairly large capacity. And we're not the only employer that might likely do that to come and visit. Uh, 
I know it's hard to get the students out, but boy, you know, that can make a real mark in a kid's mind. But there's a combo we can do of videoing a group of kids who are here while they're asking their questions and making oh, yeah. responses that then can become available more generally so not everybody can come, but you know, better than nothing is you can watch a video that shows some pieces of that. So yeah, don't kill me for bringing that up, but I'd like to give tours, I'll do it. Nope. <laughs> because I'm worried about these careers, so uh, yeah. So a bunch of hands, but I can't remember. Yeah, them, so. we'll just go with Jeff. Yeah. So I think the biggest challenge for teachers is we all have our own specialty. So I can find biomedical researchers all day to come in, and that's not a problem. The challenge, and I'm lucky with the Project Lead the Way class, they identify 36 careers they want the kids to explore during the year. So those are relatively fine. But I still have the challenge of I really want the kids to actually meet someone that does that. And what's the chance that as a collective group or getting a committee of people together to identify the jobs that are really going to make a difference that the kids don't know anything about? And as teachers, we read it and we go, I don't know what that's all about. How am I going to provide resources? So could we create that list, identify these professionals in our community, create a database? and have all of us be able to go online and be able to request someone. And I know that's not currently available, but I think that would be a great resource. And if you have a professional come in, you videotape it, you create an archive, and you say, I wasn't able to find someone, but we're gonna watch the video with that biochemical engineer, at least the kids are gonna be able to hear it from them instead of just from a website or something like that. So what's the chance that we can do something So 
Next summer, we're adding an aerospace boot camp, and it'll be down at Boeing Field, and the kids will have a chance to work on an actual uh, airplane. So I think the business community and the rest of us need to get creative about how can we make this possible for you to do it, rather than finding one more thing for classroom teachers uh, to add to your plate. Uh, I'm out in Moses Lake, so um, you know we, do, we we have the benefit of having a community college there and Job Corps is there. Uh, have you guys planned out to make contact with some of the outlying ones, other than just in the because we kind of get this east side west side uh, perception. <laughs> Our Green I mean, Expo is available statewide, and after we did the first one, OSPI really loved it, and so they've been very good about supporting us. And their only condition was it had to stay statewide. So this is available to any teacher in the state of Washington because of the travel budgets and constraints that I think this year we're really going to get hit by that. But last year we had 150 teachers, I mean literally from all over the state of Washington. So have you, have you considered setting them up on in one in Spokane or in some of the Yakima or some of the uh, I know the shop teachers are going to start regionalizing their state efforts because they think they'd be more successful if instead of trying to push everybody to Wenatchee or in this case Seattle, uh, you know, if you had uh, regional hubs you could go to. The problem you get into is the mass, I'm sorry, but, no. but for the mass of the industrial stuff, here in the city of Seattle, I mean, this stuff is all right here in the Pink Valley and Tacoma. Yeah, right now, to, to speak to that briefly, uh, you know, because there's just so much to do, we never quite get to reaching out that far. Mm -hmm. I will tell you what has worked over the years, from time to time, the colleges uh, have reached back out this way. Uh, Whitman, for example, used to send students, or they'd send a notice saying in three weeks we'll have these, here's the resumes, here are the students, we'd love for you to consider these people for summer interns, we're bossing them your way, and that made it easy, so I'd always say yes, and we ended up interviewing about seven or eight students. When they stopped bossing them, we stopped interviewing, and that was the end of that. There, there's some need to reach back the other way from the distance. And just before we leave the East West thing, my favorite high school in the state, and I think the best one pound for pound is Colville, 70 miles north of Spokane. It is so unbelievably good, you can't believe it. If there was some way to transplant the culture, the work ethic, and leadership of that high school to a place like Cleveland High School, there's just no telling what we could do. So I know there are great programs and teachers, not just on this side of the mountain. Check for a second, Steve. Do you two have questions that you want to have? Throw it out of the story. I'm just going to get feedback. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying the questions, but I, I do have one if, you'll, but the, yeah. if it's all right. And that is, I really would be interested to know at some point, we would have to do it now, what are the career expectations? Because this is something I don't have an answer to. What do your students want out of a career, out of life? What, what, what's their, because I have a 20 year old, so interesting economic expectations and, and so on. So, what are your students looking for? Uh, uh, one of my courses is called Health Careers Exploration. <coughs> and that's one of the first things I ask students at the beginning of the year. When we bring up, you know, why we go into this kind of career, why we pick this. And surprisingly, money is usually at the bottom of this, which really surprises me with teenagers. I don't know why. But, um, you know, they're interested in science usually, or they're really good at math, and they're interested in that kind of career. They want to do something that makes a difference. They want to do something. They hear, uh, several students have told me, I hear my parents say, find something you'd love to do because you're going to work the rest of your life. So find something you'd like to do. The challenge for me is I get a lot of guest speakers in from different areas. I have a lot of really, I have only juniors and seniors. So they're getting ready to make college plans. They don't know exactly what they want to do and they want to see it firsthand. And getting students into, Health careers um, observation or job channels 
have an excuse, but part of it's just that right now healthcare is running so redlined and so intense yeah. that getting them to spend any additional time beyond just keeping up with the day to day volume is really hard. And so I don't have a great answer for that. Um, because unlike the engineers who have enough, a little bit of free time uh, um, to be able to come up and speak with your class or close to someone here, the folks at healthcare, and this is reflected by the job demand. The job demand uh, uh, is going to be growing on the engineering side, but in healthcare, the Cancer Care Alliance, I'm projecting to grow 10% per year over the next five years, right? That's huge, and, and they are just, I mean, we're looking at more real estate, uh, we can't keep up with the volume of people because the baby boomers are moving into uh, care, and so it's just wild. It's getting them to slow down enough to either teach uh, at, at, at a college level or bring people in, that's a trick. So, so. Yeah. yeah, I have the same image of a solution because you can't put people who want to be pilots into airplanes and send them up. So they have these simulators. And then, you know, Boeing Museum of Flight has this whole simulation of a mission to Mars. You can't send kids to Mars to practice them. Could there be like a mobile van where you're actually having a simulation of, oh my gosh, you're, you know, we have to solve this problem, right. medical problem. And it's a, a, it literally drives into the parking lot and it's staffed by actors and actresses. Who cares? You know, and that's why you retired. And they actually do it in a simulation Museum. We have uh, one of our the groups we partner with, the Aerospace Joint Apprenticeship Committee, actually has bought for, I don't know, a quarter million, three hundred thousand dollars, a mobile machine shop uh, yeah, that is literally in a 64 foot trailer. So do one for can come right? to your school. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great idea. It's great a idea. Good idea. I'm not sure anybody within the healthcare community is thinking about that right now because they're so focused on what's going on every day. With one exception, and this I'm speaking now outside my experience at the Hutch, but I volunteered. Uh, for a long time with Planned Parenthood. And they actually are doing that. I was just completely surprised to find out. It was a there little graphic, but the, they, they actually have a computer program. You can sit down at the computer program and learn how to insert an IUD, and it gives you feedback and so on, and, and they train in that fashion. They have lots of, so there are some folks who are thinking about that, but not many. Yeah, to speak to the, what students want in a career, this is from a report yeah. that went to the, to the governor uh, last year. Um, uh, recommendations for science, technology, engineering, mathematics, education. And the students, when told, um, there's a graphic. So 30% want to help protect the environment, 26% want to improve society, 25% want to pursue a passion, 18% want to get famous and make money, and then there's 1% and the other. So the money driver is at the lower end at making a difference. So 20%. Yeah. In, in terms of you're asking about bands and simulation for healthcare. Um, this summer at the Seattle Children's Research Institute, Amanda Jones is one of the mentor scientists, and her job is actually she has a band. They have a band that goes around and does healthcare, and they wanted us to spread the word. And so it was a science band. adventure lab. Yeah. Mostly middle school towards ninth grade, but middle school uh, is their focus. What's the name? Science Adventure Lab from Seattle Children's. Yes, I was just wondering. Um, so as a new teacher, I don't always know, um, I would love to get my students into internships because I feel like you don't really know what to leave job is until you experience it. Like I got to work, uh, my dad's an engineer and um, they had a technical writing position open for two months while I was between things and I finally understood what my dad did because I was around it and I didn't, you know, I lived with him for so long and I just feel like our kids want to be successful, our kids want to find something they're passionate about, but all of the ideas that we give them are, do you want to be a doctor, do you want to be a lawyer, do you want to be a nurse, do you want to be, you know, it's all the classic ideas because they're not quite exposed to those other things. And so where, what kind of databases are available in terms of finding those internships or those camps, especially I mean, at the younger ages, when those kids, when they can't work yet and earn money, you know, that that's when the camps would be great. And then at the older ages, I mean, my, I work in Federal Way, and paid internships are something that are gold, you know, because our kids, a lot of our students do even make money over the summer, um, and they can't just work for free for eight weeks. Um, and so, you know, what kind of resources are out there in terms of that <coughs> getting them into experiences? 
can speak to the center at the Hutch here. We've had a website that, uh, and we, we take a lot of interns. I, I don't know, we probably take 100 or so every year, uh, which is significant. But the website, if you go to it, says internships are really valuable. Here's the list of faculty. Go, go for it. And so the, our internship requests just pinball everywhere. And it's horrible. And so this year, uh, uh, I actually have put somebody in place to put some structure to that. So by January, the guy's name is Scott Canavera. Uh, I don't know his phone number because he's down the hall from me, but, but by January, <laughs> by January, we should have a better front door and a process and an application triage, and we have all sorts of different kinds of internships, ranging from IT to, to engineering to healthcare and so on. So you know, by about January, take a look at the front door and keep the name Scott Canavera out there uh, um, because there'll be at least a more cogent way of approaching the hutch. Uh, what kind of, do you have any partnerships or uh, connections down in the southwest Washington area? You talk about, talk about the east-west connection. There's also a north-south disconnect um, between, for those of us in, this, in that area, to Seattle, to um, any we partnerships. We work with the Evergreen Schools uh, outside of Vancouver, which has uh, probably the best thought through career and technical education program in the state of Washington. And they're incredibly well connected with their local skills center and community college and business community. But that's that's just evergreen. I don't know beyond that down in that part of the state. Well, skills center is offered to the whole of Clark County. Right. And that's a very good one. It's a really good program, yeah. but it touches so few kids' lives. We're limited to less than a classroom set of kids to go to that facility. And there's a oh, whole bunch more know. kids that. Yeah. And, and how. How do you see us reaching more when when there's such limited resources for those kids? Because all the shops are out of schools. There there are no shops down in Clark County, down to work, except Skill Center. That's where they go to learn their electronics, their machine works, their woodworking, their dental hygiene, and, and the different programs that they have through there. Well, you're really, uh, and that's what Nancy was uh, at part of our conference last May. I mean, this is a national phenomenon. This isn't limited to the state of Washington. This nation is screwed up. And this overemphasis on believing that everybody should become a sociologist. Um, I was telling Todd, I was at my daughter's graduation. I've got two daughters seven years apart, both out of state tuition, University of Oregon. School of Sociology graduates because they were too lazy to get good enough grades to get into the UW and Western just wasn't exciting enough. And the dean of the School of Sociology at the graduation ceremony last June was bragging about in the last five years we've doubled enrollment in the School of Sociology and my wife and I just looked at each other and instantly said, why? I mean, is there a shortage? Are we it's partly because of our great tradition of being local control and not having national planning and industrial policies and that kind of thing. But I'll tell you, this nation, this is a big issue in a lot of different places. But there are other places that are, that are doing it right. There's great places like Evergreen, actually, in the state of Washington that are so doing a very what, good job. What do you see our role as high school teachers, middle school, high school teachers, in preparing these kids to to help them make those choices to go into the Clark College where, my, where I'm from. Well, I'm not in Evergreen, so I don't, I don't know what they provide for their students. I don't know what, what we do, and I don't see that connection happening. Well, so as an individual teacher, how do you, what do you see my role to help those kids take that mm -hmm. next step? Well, first of all, I think you guys are doing a better job than most people know, and I'm not just saying that to Brown knows you. The education establishment is trying to give itself a pass that life has just become so complicated and the economy is so complex, we can't hope to prepare these children for this. That's going to be up to the colleges. That's just crap. You guys are teaching the kind of fundamentals that if they don't get that kind of background, they're never going to make it in community college. They're going to never make it in a four-year baccalaureate program. So most of you, in my view, are doing a better job than most of you know. Most of you are more relevant than you know. I get back to this lack of connectivity piece and the political problem, small p political. Nobody owns the gap. Nobody owns how do we get the kids from high school to post-secondary. And I don't care what the post-secondary is. Nobody's doing a good enough job trying to do it, except the people selling traditional four-year baccalaureate programs, which is what people are obsessed with. Yeah, and if I could come in, I think at the very root of it, 
for me would be a desire for you. And I think it's happening. I mean, I see it because I get the interview with people. But there may be other people that don't make it to me uh, uh, or to my staff. But to create that spark and maybe enough opportunities to, to, to be exposed to a series of things so that at least one of those things, the spark lights on fire and it goes, wow, I could do that. I mean, if you talk to uh, um, the, our top faculty at the center here, if you talk to successful scientists, almost to a person, there's some point in their background where that spark got lit. Right. And they can tell you what it was, right. and they can tell you when it was, and so on. And, and so I would tell you, it's finding a way to make that spark to each of those students. And when you see it happen, then reach back out. Because I can tell you, when I get a call from a teacher or a college instructor or, or so on that says, this is Peter, and Peter is really lit on about this. And, and I talk to Peter, and I find out that he really is then I will find a way to get that person into an internship. Uh, um, because you can tell. Uh, it's the people that, that haven't got the spark but think that they're supposed to be in that career. Uh, this quick story, I, I remember interviewing this young woman who had gone all the way through the University of Washington. She was in her junior year. She's in a genetics program. And in the interview, she said, and, and wouldn't it be cool if you could cross humans with, you know? and I'm like, oh my god, the ethics issues. So I never really thought at all about any of that. but. It, was very good at being able to push back the knowledge. She was very smart about genetics. Had no context for it whatsoever, and, and not really any spark either. Well, before we leave this issue, the yeah. fact you're here on a Saturday picking up your SCP toolkit yeah. tells me you guys are probably spark centers. I mean, I don't, I don't think that, that this is average type behavior. So. <laughs>
and talk about it during mm -hmm. class so that it becomes an acceptable thing for those kids to do. A lot of times in high schools, that's not thought to be very acceptable. Right. It's thought to be the, the other program, right. uh, the, the program for the kids who won't be successful if what, they chose a four-year a program, Edmonds. Edmonds. So we use the Snow Line program, right. the Snow, Snow Line. program. <coughs> and it's a Snow very, Alps it's right. an excellent yeah. program. Mm -hmm. um, and many children go out of there very <coughs> successful and often great careers. Snow um, Alps great, New mm -hmm. Market's great. We don't have one in Seattle. There isn't one. It's, it's a crime. But a lot of times what happens, Dave, is that um, teachers in the building have no idea what goes on at the skill yeah, center, absolutely. what programs are available, or within the program what skills are taught. Yeah. And so as teachers, it's really important that you make yourself knowledgeable. Well, and we believe this was a cultural bias, and it had to do with the counselors. And we asked the Seattle schools if we could do a tour of businesses for counselors. This was in June after school. They said, sure you can, but none of them will show up. 21, the of, 21 of them showed up. Good. Good. They loved it. Yeah. They just had never been there. This was all over <laughs> South Seattle. They said, well, when, whenever we're down here for a Mariner game, these, there's never anything down here. Well, yeah, that's because it's the game's on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's nighttime or it's the weekend. I mean, yeah. but yeah, that's a really valid point, and there, there needs to be uh, a skill center in Seattle when we're working with it. Well, actually, just to connect that to the Hutch, we have Hutch High every yep. year where we're mm -hmm. in relationship with them. They do not get a tour of the boiler room. No, we mm -hmm. don't. Maybe. Siemens has a fellowship for teachers and there's a lot of biology teachers and chemistry teachers that are not that are part of that that are funded they aren't all shop teachers and it's a stem fellowship and it's and every year they have a long thing in Washington DC and they're really tightly connected um, so if you really are interested you know, they have, they tend to be sending these teachers and connecting these teachers. And I was curious, though, what is what's happening with STEM in the state of Washington? Because it, it, when I met these people from North Dakota and other, they were really on top of it, and I really hadn't heard anything about STEM as a science teacher. So I'm curious as whether you could explain how we could get more directly connected as science teachers and not necessarily just through the shop programs. Well, uh, we did get you recognized as STEM teachers. That was one success so far. Right. And I mean, and there's many, many, many battles to go on this stuff. Yeah. And, but just don't give up. If you like I said, you're motivated enough to be on a Saturday, I'm here on a Saturday. Huskies are playing Nebraska 12 days. <laughs> <laughs> is, there a, is there a curriculum that we could connect to? I mean, are there things that we could pull? Is there kind you know, of a national probably, database? There probably is, okay. and I'd be the last person okay. to know it. I mean, it seems like that there's stuff on everything. We just don't get connected to it. The NSTA December yes. conference has a strand on, strand okay. on STEM. Yeah. So there you go. If you want to go to NSTA, there's good opportunities right here. Almost everybody has their hand up. <laughs> 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 I just want to say something quick. Um, something in the works here at the Fred Hutch. There was a pilot program last year that Beverly Fork Store has really been pushing forward. Uh, there's a training lab, and I am happy to show you that before you go. Um, Pass Academy and Federal Way has been working. They have four students come through 90 hours of training with scientists here and then completed a summer, summer internships paid. So each of the four kids worked for eight weeks full time with a researcher and got $3,200. That is something that will grow with success. There's now, I'm working with her to help support curriculum development. We had a meeting a couple weeks ago here at the Hutch. There were about 10 to 15 scientists that all want to contribute. They want to help develop lesson plans for teachers to bring kids in. So we're, we're putting that together. If you're interested in contributing, um, I can give you my email address. If you're interested in seeing what the training lab looks like, um, I'm happy to show it to you. Um, I've been partnering with Glacier Peak High School in Snohomish. We're gonna have um, a display at NSCA, and we're also gonna have a display at the um, Green Expo. So there's things in the works, there's scientists excited about you know, from the Fred Hutch to contribute to what are the things that you want to learn that they want to right? Yep, and we're also doing something similar with something called here in town called the Year Up, which is a program yes, that takes yeah. kids 
Uh, and we've got two interns from uh, Europe, and we're paying full salary as IT support folks. Yeah. Uh, I think our investment is about 20000 per kid in that right now to see if that works. Uh, and there are a number of other things. As I said, we sponsor this inter apprenticeship program for engineers and so on. We have a self-interest in that, but it's really important to us. <coughs> it wasn't simple to set up, but uh, um, the problem with that program, the BEVS program, it's very cool, but scaling it is going to be a trick yeah. because it takes space. How do we find out that information? That's why I have this person, uh, Scott Canavera, started. He's the triage into all these different things that are going uh, from work study on through to post back positions. He'll, he'll handle that spectrum of, of the internship. I was just thinking a low, low effort, maybe helpful idea could be, um, I, I don't, I'm not an engineer, I haven't a clue what, what engineers and how to do it, but I, I taught biology for a bunch of years, as have most of us, and so it, I'm just envisioning this Venn diagram or this list that says when you talk about mitosis, right. when you when you go into food webs and food chains, you know, you're working with this this type of topic, here are some engineering connections. So just, it, it wouldn't be, I don't think it would be hard to put together just have a bunch of people I don't normally talk with and don't, you know, and don't run in the same circles with, to just sit down with a group of us and say, here's what we do, what do you do? And just, just it would be one afternoon. Yeah, I mean, I think you could probably, it would be a trick to find the people who are willing and, and to invest the time to do that. I would also ask you the question, why not have the students do that? Because Actually, when you say that to me, the first thing I think of is mitosis is entirely engineering. You have to look at the little bundles and what's the tensile strength of the bundles that's pulling apart the chromosomes. That, it's all engineering, right? The, 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 you know, engineering and biology and chemistry don't uh, uh, exist in separate bands. They are very heavily overlapped, right? They can in biology make total sense, but I, I just, I'm just, I, I think thinking back on the conversations with someone else, I just don't know. Two quick comments. One is, remember our colleagues at Seattle Biomed have made this really lovely poster <clears throat> that, that this is salary range going up over here. <clears throat> this is educational uh, requirements, so high school, community college, university. And then there are all these different job pathways. So here's health <coughs> materials removal worker, lab construction manager, civil engineer, urban regional planner, community <coughs> health advisor, jumping on over to the blues, drug developer, biostats, green pharmacist, epidemiologist, and so on. Uh, over here there's marketing, grants management, development officers. So this is available online for free, and then we also have some copies we've been giving away. Each of these job paths then is also described in a bit more detail in a booklet that you can download as a PDF from their website. So each of those jobs, there's a page on that. So that's... Um, can you send a link back? I have sent it a few times, and I will keep sending it. Put on a note that says, read this before you delete it. We have about five more minutes before this chunk ends. And so if you have a burning question, put your hand up. I want to We are talking about the gap. And I think when our discussion what we forgot are the parents. And I do, uh, and I noticed that uh, we have parent night, and uh, my IB classes, all the parents come, but my regular classes, the parents, uh, the few that come are very interested, but we need to reach out to the parents because they don't know. They have to pay uh, the, the college or uh, um, any other education they get beyond high school. So we really need to reach out to them and educate them, educate them as to what's out there, what's the spectrum. We really think it's important. When you talk with Susan, you know, we've taken all, almost all the shops out of high school in mm -hmm. Seattle. So we've closed that option for the students to get exposure to it. So when you're talking with her, Try to emphasize to get. Let's get on the path of getting the shops back in high school. 
Well, and if you're creative, that's, that's why we did the, the construction boot camp at Local right. 32. We in this city, uh, it's unique in terms of the rest of the state. We have the training facilities. They're owned by these apprenticeship programs. They're vacant uh, mostly during the day. And the Puget Sound Skill Center in Burien uh, actually uses the local 32 of the plumbers and the pipe fitters to teach us an outstanding construction program. And so there's ways to get there, and we are talking here about that stuff. We're better off than we know. It, it, it's just a uh, lack of awareness right now. And Dave, this report is still on the website. Is yeah. Mm -hmm. So on the Manufacturing Industrial Council website, is, there are two links. So one of them is to report about how math is a real limiter. The other one is this thing called uh, Pathways to Prosperity, which is a recent study that really points out what we're just talking about, that all of those From the Harvard programs. Graduate School of Education. You expect me to say this. And what I'm saying, everything I've said is confirmed in the Harvard report. They're looking at how all those programs are going away, and they're looking at European well, models that are yeah. successful. And those models tend to be the kind of models where you integrate work and apprenticeships much, much more at the high school level. And so that transition that we've been talking about is clear. So you can get a link to that, read PDF, and you can use that to kind of start some conversations at your school. He is leading is the tour for the school board members. Uh, for our pre-conference. So it's going to be pushing in conversations from all directions. It's not going to be, you know, one person's right. job and that's going to fix it. You know, Scott Cannon Harris is not going to be able to fix it. It's going to take lots of us all pushing, but that is one way that you can get <laughs> some more background on this and uh, kind of pass them on to the administration. I just want to be clear. My, uh, my name is Carrie Fox. Um, the Green Expo, is it, it's open for teachers can I bring my students? Yeah, absolutely. So it's open for students? Because I was thinking it would be really neat to have sort of a conference that's geared only towards students, not for the teachers. We started it out only for teachers, and uh, after two of them, we just realized, everybody just kept saying, why can't we bring students? And so you can. So it's, uh, there's, the, there's a website, you can register, the whole thing is up there. And it'll, we'll have a huge update in about three days uh, we pretty much have the whole program now, and it's, it's really going to be fun. And, and I want to make a quick plug, although it's it's a year away. So, but and for those of you that might be interested, or for those of you who might have students that would be interested, it's unusual. But the Society for the Advancement of Chicano and Native American Scientists is holding its conference here in Seattle for the first time. Usually, it's in the American Southwest, but they're going to be up here in Seattle in October of 2012. And this is a really big deal, and it's an aggregation of high-powered scientists from the Latino and the Native American community and, and the African American community as well. And so th this would be a place for some of your students to go to really link into uh, um, that. So it's a big deal. And finding those conferences sort of outside the, the education world and getting people into uh, <coughs> it is, and can really work with lighting that spark for us. Actually, the Scientist website actually has biographies of lots of people there in all different kinds of career realms. Right. You know, there are places that these kinds of biographies and stories are buried. Another one is the thing called Findings that I have included copies of in the kits occasionally. And uh, it's available through the same web link here. Magazine, paper, <coughs> free sets from the government. You can go online and read. There's lots of stories that are really well done. So that you see the people side of the scientist as well as their work <coughs> described. All right, way back. <laughs> I, I just see for our group too, and for some people who are far flung, that Skype for our classroom has been a wonder as far as it's very engaging for kids. I know that other people have used it in their classroom, but I can just really see them if they can't actually physically go into a healthcare center then maybe they can Skype and the person, we, we did this on a, a research boat that's out in the middle of the ocean um, and they were doing drilling. And we got to Skype with the scientists, they took us around the boat and they showed us the drill cords, we talked to the scientists on the boat. We were there in real time and the kids were engaged wow. and talking to them. And I don't see if there's any reason they couldn't go to a boiler room downtown Seattle. We don't have to take our kids there, but they can take them there virtually and they're engaged. And I just see that all we need to know is who do we connect to to make that happen? Where is there an engineer that would love to talk to these kids via Skype and yeah, we have those low engineers. budget and accessible to everybody? Yeah, and I'm not sure we have the rad techs because they're so bloody busy. But yeah. <laughs> but keep, keep reaching and we'll try and reach back. Yeah. Too, so, yeah. How do we reach that? We kind of leave into my.
my question. I was really excited about the construction boot camp. I think that would be great for our students. We're at Mount Vernon area, so yeah. a little bit further north. So my question is, you know, what kind of advice or resources or who do I contact? The I association do do it, The Association of General Contractors do a statewide uh, construction day. It's October 6th this year, and they've sold out. They have 1,100 kids coming. Ironically, it's at Magnuson Park, and there are almost no kids from Seattle who are going. No, it's necessarily not. Well, the AGC is a statewide group. Uh, you were referencing over there the building construction trade. That, that's, the, the, the building trades are organized all over the state in a, in a way that uh, is unusual. So get a hold of AGC, Diane Coaster. Yeah. We know he's in charge. Yeah, email her and we'll, we'll get you hooked up. So I'm just totally curious. To give away. And maybe we yeah. can talk about this afterwards, but are you connected with the lady that does bamboo cloning? Oh, I Up in Mount Vernon? Mm -hmm. She's amazing. And she has more PhDs in cloning up there than anyone I've ever met. It's, it's Is that her name? Lady? Oh. <laughs> Digester in Mount Vernon that causes <laughs> cow manure and to electricity. Yeah. And it's built by Angar. The company, it's called Angar, A N D G A R. Email to Nancy because we had them at last year's Green Expo and they'll do tours. They build the technology in Ferndale. Really great company. All right. How about I will leave some index cards and we will let you write questions if you have more of these questions because. We have to let these guys go. <laughs> but we will collect the questions and we will use this partly with this ongoing conversation yeah. in the district, but also Dave is doing big work around the state. He's got OSPI. Yeah, he's looking at So we'll see what we can Don't do. Don't get discouraged. No. Yeah. Be aware. <laughs> and I'm just going to give each of you, because I love this quote in Wisconsin. Oh, thank you. About a kind of school school. Oh, that's great. So a little thank you. And before we end, thank you so much yeah, for doing what you do every day.